My grandfather told me a story once as we sat around a campfire in his backyard in the cool night of the Arizona desert. The horizon was clear and each star twinkle in a purple sky with a full fat moon hanging low over the mountains. His voice was raspy, the result of a lifetime of smoking cigars and drinking whiskey. The fire danced and shined across his wide dark eyes as he settled into his seat, ready to tell his story. Way back when I was a boy, about your age, I lived outside a reservation with your great grandfather. He had returned from the war and set about raising horses and cattle on a 100 acre ranch saddled between a brambly mountainside with good dirt for growing thorn brush and not much else. One night, my mother was sick and Pa and I took a trip into town about 50 miles away, straight through a dry desert over a washed out creek and some old abandoned farmsteads. Pa and I were driving in an old Ford pickup truck. I remember it was dark out, inky and thick with only the lights of our old truck lighting up the road. I remember it so much. The engine began to sputter, and the truck slowed to a jerky stop. Damn it, Pa said, guiding the Ford to the side of the road. As it coasted to a stop, my Pa said, Stay here, son, and he stepped out into the darkness, shutting the door with a heavy thud. My window was down and the cool desert air was breezy and felt good on my hot face and neck. Paul was getting water from the back to cool down the engine and that's when I smelled it. Rotten eggs. Strange, I thought, to smell sulfur in the desert. My nose also picked up the smell of one of those dead bloated cattle that would drop from the heat and lay there until the crows pecked enough holes in their hide to cause the whole thing to explode. It stunk and I gagged. My skin started to tingle too. The back of my neck felt itchy and my face started to get very hot. The wind stopped blowing with the stink filling the cab. Pa, I called out, no answer. My heart started beating and I felt such a fear in me, in my bones, in my chest. I tell you, I never felt fear like this. Not until Vietnam. Not until I saw men dying around me. I locked the door and reached over for my pa's door and saw a shadow bound across the road through both dim beams of light across the partly open hood. Grandfather paused telling the story. He spit a fat piece of tobacco to his side and he looked very pensive into the darkness. I realized I was holding my breath and gasped for air. The night was breezy, but I was sweating and clammy. What about your father? What did you see? My grandfather, continuing the story, sighed. A creature. He shook his head. You have to understand, there were legends. Old legends. Much older than what's out there in the valley. Older still than Crazy Horse and Sitting Bull, than the old chiefs and their shamans, the Apache and Hopi and Cherokee and all them old tribes and first peoples. They told tales. They told stories about dark magic. Something about a deal made with the old spirits of blood sacrifice to gain power, old power, enough to fight each other and the Spaniards, and later, the white man that came for their land and women, they called them. He paused. Grandfather took a deep breath and looked towards the fire, to the sky, the desert, the creek, the moon, the sun, and then leaned a little bit and said, they would call them skinwalkers, old warriors, Resurrected as skinless men, walking on deer legs with the torso of a man 
and the head of a coyote, but they were messed up, long and disfigured, teeth like a bowie knife, long arms, and standing seven feet tall, even hunched over. They would gut the old cowboys and white riders. They'll run through the bullets, part the Spanish armor like it was a potato sack. And boy, could they change their voice to match a person you knew or might know. And that's what I saw, big and fast. Only for a second, it ran across the road, gray and molted, muscle flexing under its legs, clumping on the road, stringy muscle hunched shoulders, and it turned, looked right into the cab, and looked at me, right into my eyes, and I swear, I swear, it grinned at me, I sank into my seat, in fear, shaking, I knew my death was coming, I smelled ozone and brimstone, the air felt like right before the lightning comes, and blows a tree to smithereens, charged them full with power, I yelled for Pa, but no words came out, just a dry squeak. I started to shake as my grandfather told his story, he was still here, so I knew he lived, but the supernatural always fascinated me, and even now, I felt the force of his words. The real power of skinwalkers was trickery. Sure, they could change their voices, but also their skin. That's why the gods took their hide, so they could take others. Not for long, the legend says, maybe an hour, before the soul of the skin that they were wearing would come looking for their mortal shell before going to whatever hell awaited them. Even though I think that getting skinned alive was hell enough. A minute passed in what felt like a lifetime. One second in one thousand years. My father's door opened. And I jerked my head to the left. Putting up my hands to fend off an attack. Son, it's me. My father said. Before climbing into the cab. He got the steering wheel. And pulled himself in an awkward way. Jerking himself into the seat. I cringed into the corner. I looked at him. I looked hard. Your great grandfather was a good man. Treated me and my mom right. He fought the Nazis and saw the worst of man in Poland when he freed all those camps. And now I was taking his measure. Is this my father? Do I make a run? Or do I die? Is it him or not? Let's go get that medicine for your mom, as he pulled the truck into gear and pulled it out into the road, and our trip resumed. I guess it was him after all, but how did you know? Was it because he said something about your mom? I knew, because out the window, out the corner of my eye, I saw that same beast running 50 miles an hour right next to our car, looking at me with those yellow eyes and grinning mouth. I looked and saw it, hunched and angry, running next to us. My pa kept his eyes on the road, looking straight ahead. Son, he said, don't look at it. That's how I knew it was my dad. He knew what to do, and he kept telling me to just keep looking straight ahead and to not look at whatever was around us, running. He then told me that by acknowledging its presence, you give it power. That's where my grandfather finished the story. I kept staring at him, but by this time, he was just looking straight ahead, looking around me, and said we should go inside. As we went inside the house, he then told me, to not ever mention skinwalkers. He also said that speaking their name out loud or mentioning them at all, even in text, even in stories, even if someone else is telling you a story, is supposed to make them 
aware of your existence. To give some perspective on the scenario, we live in an apartment complex at the edge of town in Illinois. Right next to us is a woody area full of coyotes and deer and lots of birds, so it's pretty lively. Last night at 3 a.m., my fiance went outside to grab a case of water from the trunk of our car, and when she was grabbing it, she claimed she heard someone say, hello, in a girl's voice coming from the woods. She said she couldn't see anything, but she replied back, confused saying hello back, whatever it was, ended up saying, can somebody help me? And that's when she got the chills and ran as fast as she could back inside our house. Right before she entered the house, she said that she heard it again, with the voice getting closer, asking for help. But instead of a normal girl voice, it turned into a girl voice that didn't even sound real and she couldn't explain the change in the voice. She said afterwards, thinking about it, that her voice sounded familiar but couldn't point out whose voice. Why I believe she wasn't BSing around is because two years living here, we never talked about things like this. And when she rushed inside, she startled me because her face was in shock and she was breathing heavily, almost like I thought she seen something or heard a gunshot. I don't know. My question is she thinks it was a skinwalker because who would be out at 3 a.m. asking for someone to help them in the woods? What do you guys think? I also read online that you aren't supposed to interact nor share the encounter that you had about a skinwalker. She will be alright this one time sharing the story. I hope. This next story comes from Gallup, New Mexico. A Navajo woman, now in her late 60s, recalls a time when she is yet a little girl. She has this feeling there is someone outside their house. She runs to her father who is still in bed, the sun just starting to come up. After finally begging her father to get up, he gets out of bed, puts on some shoes, and goes out to the yard to check. Walking around towards the side of the house to which her bedroom is situated, he notices what appears to be a coyote, or dog prints, there in the soil directly below her window. The strangest thing out of all this is that there is a trail consisting of only one clear print and beside it a round impression which seems to sit a bit deeper if there was a coyote outside her window it was standing upright and on one canine like foot and something that's not canine like while he is making his way back into the house something across the way catches his eye there, upon a small hill to the other side of the dirt road, is a strange looking old man. His eyes refracting the early sunlight, his hair long and yellowy, and his clothes worn and dirty, ripped apart. But what's more strange out of all this is that he is standing there, barefoot, missing the lower part of his other leg and supporting himself with the aid of a simple cane of wood. This story is from Fort Belknap. Two of my friends and I are by the street in front of my house, hanging out and talking. I notice down the block, a ways underneath the halo of the street light, there's this dog. It's just sitting there, but it definitely is not one of the dogs from around the neighborhood, and there's something about it that just doesn't look right to me. I turn to my friends to see what they think, 
And when they look to where I'm pointing, the dog is gone. And out of nowhere, there's this guy dressed in some grubby clothes, long dirty hair, maybe in his late 20s or early 30s, and definitely in need of a shave. The funny thing though, is that he's walking straight towards us and getting closer, but we still can't make out his eyes, almost as if he doesn't have any. Even though we were three against one, without saying a word, we all just started running towards my house. Right up the porch we go, slamming the door behind us. No sooner are we inside, it's like every dog in the neighborhood is barking and whining as if they are scared. Then, just like that, everything gets real quiet, as if somebody hit the mute button. I'm not sure how long we stay there crouched down low and against the wall beneath the windows. But finally, one of my friends elbows me in the shoulder and tells me with his head that I should take a look outside. Not wanting to look like a complete pussy, I move the curtain aside and peek out. I don't see anything, so I go and open the door. Whoever that guy was, he's gone, and everything seems as it always is. Needless to say, we hung out on the porch for the rest of the night. This story comes out of Arizona. Three siblings are returning home to the reservation for a weekend visit with their parents. Their trip is taking them from Phoenix to the family home in Low Mountain and Pinion. It's a trip of about five hours. They leave fairly late in the evening. As they approach Keem's Canyon Highway, they turn onto a dirt road leading straight into Low Mountain. Just before they reach the dirt road, they notice an old lady bent from age and walking with a cane on the side of the highway. It is about 2 o'clock in the morning. She has a scarf over her head and a long black jacket beneath and she is also wearing a green dress. Their only thought is that it's a late hour for walking along an isolated highway pretty much in the middle of nowhere. The reservation is really dark at night and there is barely anyone driving on the roads. After they pass the old woman, they make the turn onto the dirt road. A mile later, they notice the same old lady, bent and walking with her cane there on the side of the dirt road. Spooked by the incident and finding no explanation that would provide for the woman's presence, they had been passed by no other vehicle since turning onto the back road the older brother, who is driving, steps on the gas and puts distance between them and the roadside specter. Together, the three of them recite some words in Navajo to protect them from any dark medicine. Eventually, they reach the highway that leads to Chinle. As they come to the first overpass, they see that same old lady sitting on the shoulder pavement with her head down and waving the cane in the air. Before they can pass her by, the car stalls out and they are required to row to a stop a short distance past the woman. Desperately, the older brother attempts to get the car started, but there's no response. At this point, with all three of them panicking, the old lady stands up facing the opposite way so they can't see her face and she walks to the other side of the road once there she turns her head for but a moment and they see that her face is painted black she keeps walking and eventually disappears in the distance now out of sight the brother again turns the key in the ignition and the car starts they make it to their parents' home with no further encounters. When they tell their parents about the experience, their fathers tells them of an old Navajo couple with a house back in the trees somewhere between the two highways. They are rumored to practice bad medicine 
and bewitch people from what he knows. The old man passed away recently and ever since then the old woman has been frequently been seen at night walking the highways and the back roads. I heard this account from a guy that I knew. He was my friend when we were in a small town in Oklahoma with a decent size native population. Anyways, this guy, he's not actually Navajo, but he's Mexican. He's the nicest dude you would ever want to meet. He was about 35 at the time. He had a family. He was honest, a good nature guy that I could never see making something up for no reason. But we were hanging out one night and we were telling scary stories. And he was telling me about the most scariest situation that he's ever been in. He said he was driving back to the U.S. after visiting family in Mexico. His wife was in the passenger seat, asleep. He wasn't too far from the border, so he decided to keep driving a little after midnight. Instead of stopping somewhere for the night. It was sort of a desert type road. He says he was going about 65 miles per hour when he noticed something in his peripheral vision out in the darkness out the passenger window and it was keeping up with him obviously this got him shook he hit the gas 70 75 80 85 and it was still keeping up with him at this point he thought he was going crazy he thought it was just his tiredness playing tricks on his eyes until it changed directions. Instead of moving parallel with his car, it began to angle back towards the road in a manner almost to intercept the vehicle. As it got closer, more light hit it and he said it looked like a human. He told me it was slightly shadow from the darkness, but he was for sure it was a humanoid form. He then accelerated to 90 and a few seconds later, it angled back into the darkness and was gone. As he finished telling me the story, I could tell his eyes were welled up and his hands were trembling. And this was a tough no BS dude. It physically struck him to the core just to recall it. Not surprising, he said he has never gone back to Mexico in a vehicle. Now... He said that whenever he does go visit, he only goes on flights. Jacob cursed as he pushed through the thick underbrush, trying to make his way to the tree stand he had built earlier in the summer. He was for sure that this location would give him a good sight to the neighboring field, in which he frequently saw large herds of deer. This was going to be his year. And he was sure of it. This is the year that I bring home my trophy buck, he told himself, as he recalled the events of the day so far. He had awakened at 4.30 a.m. He began to get ready for the long day in the woods, on the backside of his farm. His first order of business had been to locate and rescue his gloves and camouflage hunting gear from whatever undisclosed area of his home that his wife had hidden them. He was gonna need them this morning to protect him from the bitter cold November morning. How could it be this cold this early in the year? He wondered as he started to work on his second task of the day, which was to make a breakfast that would stick to his ribs long into the day. But he finally settled on toast, country ham, and scrambled eggs. He topped it all off with a large cup of coffee that had left a bitter aftertaste in his mouth. In fact, he could still taste it. After this, he packed himself a cheese sandwich for lunch. He grabbed his Remington hunting rifle, some coffee, and headed out the door. He loaded his gear into his truck and pulled out of the driveway and turned right into the one-lane blacktop road 
that led to the backside of his property. After about two and a quarter miles, he turned right again. He had to travel about half a mile down that pitiful rut filled excuse for a road when he came to his desired location. He then got out of his truck and loaded his gun and walked off into the woods. Ten minutes out of the truck and he was already cold and it was made worse by the cloudy overcast day and the wind that was blowing through the trees making all the leaves rattle like dry bones. Oh well, he thought, it's gonna be a good day anyway, especially if I bring home a big one. Jacob took about 10 more steps when an uneasy feeling began to creep over him. He felt as though someone had stepped over his grave. He got the distinct feeling that he was being watched, but by whom? This was, after all, his property and it was posted. No one had permission to be on his land. He had to be alone, but if he was alone, why couldn't he shake this eerie feeling that was scratching at the base of his skull? Something was off today. There was a silence in the forest. No birds, no insects, only the sound of the wind in the trees. Convincing himself that it was nothing more than a case of nerves, he continued to press on until he came to a clearing, not too far from his tree stand. Stepping into the clearing, Jacob saw the remains of what appeared to be a large deer, but he wasn't quite able to make out what he was seeing from this distance because the sun wasn't completely up yet and the forest was still covered in shadows. Jacob then walked closer to get a better look and found that he had been correct. It was a deer, a large eight point buck in fact. Looking at the remains, he felt a sense of dread come over him and icy fingers stance along his spine. Something about this kill just didn't seem right. The throat was completely torn out and the stomach was ripped open. Plus, also several of the internal organs were missing. This definitely wasn't a coyote kill, and no hunter would have done this. They would have taken the head to have it mounted. What could have done this, he wondered. A fear like nothing he had ever experienced before began to wash over him in waves. What is going on, he thought. At nearly 225 pounds and well over six foot, he wasn't one to give in to fear, but now he couldn't seem to calm down and his heart was beating like a trip hammer. That feeling that he was being watched was getting stronger by the minute and he couldn't shake the feeling that he was moments away from a bad situation. He slowly started to back away from the mango body and head back to his truck and back to safety. No more than six steps into his journey, his blood turned to ice in his veins as a deep, guttural scream shattered the eerie silence and what was left of his courage. He had grown up on the farm all of his life and had been an experienced hunter since he was a child. He was familiar with every animal in the part of the state. Fear now gave way to stark terror as he chambered around into his Remington rifle and turned around only to find there was nothing behind him. His mind raced with confusion and he was confronted with a million thoughts at once. What should I do? What could it be? Should I run? Am I gonna die? His survival sense kicking into overdrive. Jacob decided to continue on his previously contrived plan which was to get to the truck and get out of there. Slowly and cautiously, he made his way toward the perceived salvation of his vehicle, silently praying every step of the way. With 300 yards separating him from his only avenue of escape, Jacob began to hear heavy footfalls off to his left. He could hear the crunching of withered leaves, sticks, and the breeze that littered the forest floor. Summoning every ounce of courage that remained within him, he forced himself to look in the direction 
of the noise. And that is when he saw the dark silhouette that followed him through the forest. Quickening his pace, he redoubled his efforts to reach the truck and get to a phone and call the sheriff, the game warden, or anyone that would listen. He couldn't tell what it was that was stalking him, but he could clearly see that it towered more than seven feet and was incredibly massive. Jacob couldn't help but think that he was about to become a national statistic, a person who left home under normal circumstances and just disappeared without a trace. How many people, he wondered, go into the woods and just vanish, and the authorities just assume that they have become lost, injured, or been the victims of animal attacks, with their bodies never recovered. Please God, don't let that happen to me, he told himself as he drew closer and closer to his truck. 75 yards became 50, and 50 became 30, and 30 became 10. And like a miracle, he was back and opening his door. Throwing his rifle inside, he pulled himself up into the cab and started the engine and hit the gas. But the truck went nowhere. He had parked in a puddle of mud, and now the tires simply spun in place. Not now, he thought. I can't be stuck, allowing himself a moment to think. Jacob would remember, this truck is a four-wheel drive. There is no way I can be stuck, and was ready to punch the gas and leave this nightmare behind. Unfortunately for Jacob, some nightmares are not so easily left behind. And there is nothing worse than a nightmare you can't wake up from. And Jacob was about to learn that the hard way. Hearing something to his right, he turned and immediately wished that he had not. It took him maybe half a second to turn his head. But he would have given anything in the world to have that half second back. Because it was the last moment that his world would ever see normal again. In that split second... His world changed. It was no longer a place where the world was light and safe, where he was just a husband and a dad and a guy that liked to go hunting and watch football on the weekends. That reality had evaporated away and all that was left was a world where monsters existed and things really do go bump in the night. And now an ambassador from that nightmare realm was standing just outside his passenger door, a visible reminder that his world had been turned upside down. Jacob screamed as he stared transfixed on this escapee from a horror movie. In his most terrifying, fevered dream, he couldn't have imagined that such a thing could exist. It was hideously ugly, easily standing eight feet tall with a thick, muscular body. There was just something about that face that was just wrong. Almost like a mixture of a man and an animal experiment that had gone horribly wrong. It was the most terrifying thing he had ever seen. It was completely covered with thick shaggy black hair that was matted in areas with God only knows what. And it walked on two legs, not on four legs like you would expect from some kind of animal. What was this thing that had shattered his perception of reality? Was it a demon? Was it a werewolf? It can't be, he thought. Those things don't exist. But whatever it was, it was staring at him, and it didn't look happy. The menacing juggernaut threw its enormous head back and let out a blood-crawling scream that resonated throughout the surrounding area and seemed to vibrate him to his very core. Shocked back into action, Jacob threw his truck into gear and took off as though he was being chased by the very hounds of hell. Jacob, with his mind racing, wondered what he was going to do. How will I ever feel safe on this farm again, he thought. Are my wife and children in danger? What and where did this thing come from? And will anyone believe me? The whirlwind of thoughts that swirled through Jacob's mind came to an immediate stop as he slammed on his brakes and nearly slid off the road. In a state of disbelief, 
Jacob sat staring at the large hackberry tree that lay across the dirt road and blocked his path, preventing him from reaching the black top and guarantee safety. How is this even possible? He thought. I just came down this road not even 30 minutes ago, and this path was clear. It was painfully obvious to Jacob that he had to get that tree moved if he was going to make it back home. Since he didn't have a chain to pull the tree out of the road, nor did he have a saw with which he could cut up the unexpected barricade, he was left with a few options, one of which was walking, which he discounted immediately. The most logical course of action that he could come up with was to call for help. His best friend Kenny Patterson owned the farm just over from his. If he were home, he could bring a saw and cut the tree up for him. Jacob, with his nerves still frazzled and frayed, reached into his glove box and pulled out his cell phone and dialed Kenny's number. The phone rang six times and Jacob was about to give up when Kenny answered the phone and said, Hey ugly, what do you want this early in the morning? As quickly as he could, he told the recent events to Kenny and said, Please, hurry. I'm not kidding. There is something out here. Kenny, hearing the shakiness in his friend's voice, assured him that he would be there in a matter of minutes. Jacob thanked him and hanged up the phone, and braced himself for what he was sure would be the longest few minutes of his life. Sitting motionless inside of his truck, every sound made his imagination run wild with fear. Even though little more than three minutes had passed since he had spoken to Kenny, it felt as if hours had passed. The clock seemed to be an eternity. Jacob frequently checked in all directions for any sign to see if this nightmarish monstrosity had pursued them. In every shadow that the forest and on this cloudy day produced, he thought he saw the shape of the black beast that had followed him out of the woods, and he was afraid that he would lose himself long before Kenny arrived to clear the tree out of his path. After what seemed like a lifetime, Jacob heard the sound of Kenny's old truck sputtering up the road, and in just moments, he was able to see the old red Chevy as it made its way closer to him. Jacob's spirits lifted when he saw his old friend, and a sense of relief washed over him as he realized that he was no longer alone. Stepping out of his truck, Jacob said, Man, what took you so long? I told you to hurry. Kenny, with a surprised look on his face, What are you talking about? You only called me 11 minutes ago. I think I made pretty good time. Jacob could hardly believe that only 11 minutes had passed. It had seemed so much longer. After apologizing to his friend and telling him exactly how happy he was to see him, both men walked over to the fallen tree and made a discovery that startled them both. The tree had not broken. It had not been cut. It had been pushed over and completely uprooted. All around the tree were large bipedal footprints that had a somewhat human appearance to them. But if they were human, the owner would require a size 28 shoe. Jacob and Kenny looked at each other and then without a word went to work on the tree. Kenny took a chainsaw from the bed of his truck and began to cut up the fallen blockade. Meanwhile, Jacob pulled the logs and debris from the road. Mission accomplished. Kenny put away his saw and he and Jacob were about to get in their vehicles and leave. But before they could even open their doors, an ear-splitting scream erupted from the woods behind them. Jacob walked over to Kenny and whispered, that's what I was telling you about. I don't know what that thing is, man, but it looks like some kind of monster. And I think we need to get out of here now. Kenny looked as though the blood had drained completely out of his face, became very pale as he said to Jacob, Jacob, man, I never mentioned this to anyone before now, but over the last few months, that thing has been killing off a few of my cows. Their throats are usually torn out, and the bodies are mangled and broken. 
I didn't want anyone to accuse me of being crazy and making stuff up. So I never said anything about it. But that's the reason I rushed over here when you called. I actually heard that sound a few times off in the distance at night. But never this close. So I think you are right, old buddy. It's time to go. Cautiously and with a sense of urgency, Jacob and Kenny climbed into their vehicles and made their way back into the blacktop. Both vehicles then began the two and a half mile trek that led back to Jacob's house so they could decide what course of action should be taken. Jacob could feel the temperature drop as snow began to gently fall. He then reached over and turned his wipers on as snow began to pelt the windshield harder. As he passed his neighbor, William Springer's farm, he noticed a herd of deer grazing in the field that bordered his own property. Having put a distance between himself and the nightmare he had just encountered, Jacob felt a renewed sense of security as his fatigued nerves began to calm down. Not willing to let this opportunity pass him by, Jacob turned on his hazard lights and pulled to the shoulder of the road and signaled Kenny to do the same. Kenny knew what Jacob was thinking as he pulled in behind him and turned his ignition off. Getting out of his truck, Kenny said, What are you doing, man? We need to get out of here now. Jacob said, I know, and we will, in just a minute, man. I just can't turn this down. I have to take the shot. That's a six-point buck standing there. It's not the trophy that I wanted, but at least I won't end up going home empty-handed. And after what happened this morning, I think I deserve a little something good. All right, just take the shot so we can go. I still don't feel right about this, Kenny said. Jacob steadied his rifle across the hood of his truck. He zeroed in on the buck and was getting ready to fire. That's when he heard Kenny make a gasping noise and whisper, Oh my God, what is it, man? What's wrong with you? Raise your scope three inches, he said. Raising the scope, Jacob immediately saw what had been the cause of Kenny's alarm. Standing just outside the tree line in the edge of the field was the creature that they had left behind. Not even five minutes. Was this thing following them? Was it after the deer? What was it doing? Jacob watched the creature through his scope for a full 30 seconds before it even moved. And when it did, it ignored him and the deer and started to walk towards William's barn that was just about 500 yards from where the woodland demon had been standing. Jacob called out to Kenny and said, Kenny, call William and tell him that there is something trying to get into his barn. I know he has livestock in there, and if that thing gets in it, it will kill all of them. Attempting to get rid of this monster, werewolf, wendigo, or whatever it was, Jacob fired a shot but missed. The creature turned towards them and glared at them through red, hate-filled eyes and then began to run towards them at full steam. Kenny, who was still on the phone with William, screamed at Jacob to get in his truck and go. Jacob did as he was told and Kenny followed right behind him. Starting their trucks, Jacob and Kenny both raced to Jacob's house as though they were driving on the NASCAR circuit. Arriving at home, Jacob gun in hand, ran inside to get a phone book so that they could call the game warden and the police and get some kind of animal control out there to get rid of this thing. Jacob had just stepped out of his front porch when they heard gunfire coming from over at William's place. Dropping the phone book and running back inside, Jacob grabbed his 12 gauge shotgun and some shells and handed them to Kenny who took little time in loading it. Jacob and Kenny now locked and loaded walked together to their truck and got ready to mount up a rescue for their neighbor William. Simultaneously, both of them stopped in their tracks as a familiar but uneasy feeling crept over them and Jacob's two German shepherds began to whimper and ran under the front porch to hide. Kenny, whose throat had gone dry as a bone, whispered to Jacob and said, I have a really bad feeling about this. No sooner had the words escaped his lips, they heard a scream erupt from the forest, off to the right, and the creature exploded from the trees in front of them. Until now, 
neither man had been able to fully appreciate the colossal size and scope of the beast. But standing less than 30 feet away from them, they were almost overcome by the sheer magnitude of it. Jacob had seen it up close earlier from his truck while sitting down and had guessed the height at maybe 8 feet. But now, standing there, looking up, he could tell that this fellow was 8.5 or 9 feet tall and would tip the scale at 800 to 1,000 pounds. It had inhuman long arms that were easily seen beneath its long shabby black hair which covered it from head to toe. The chest was larger than a 55 gallon drum and there was little doubt that it could have pulled the arms off an ape and now it stood there staring at them. Jacob and Kenny both opened fire without hesitation. The creature screamed with rage as the bullets tore into its massive body knocking it to the ground but not killing or seriously injuring it. Jacob and Kenny watched speechless as it crawled into the tree line, struggled to its feet, and limped away. Jacob ran back to the porch and grabbed the phone book and called the local game warden. Nearly two hours later, Gene, the local warden, showed up to take their statements and told them that he had been called out to answer numerous such reports in the area, but he wasn't sure what to make of all these reports. Guys, he said. I don't know what to tell you, there is no animal in this area, or any area for that matter that fits your description. I'm not saying I don't believe you, I just don't know what it is. Jacob whose face was reddened with anger said, come here, here is the blood from where we shot it and here are the footprints. A look of complete confusion washed over Gene's face and he asked if they would care to go with him as he tried to track it. Jacob and Kenny agreed but they said they weren't going without a gun. Gene stated that he planned to take his gun as well. All three men loaded their guns and set out following the tracks and droplets of blood that had fallen on the leaves. They followed the trail for about a mile until arriving at a creek that was located deep in Jacob's woods where the tracks that they were following were joined by others just like them. Some were smaller, but at least one set was larger. Deciding that the safest course of action would be to return home, they all went back to Jacob's. None of them gave up the idea of staying out in the woods, longer since there was now, apparently, more than one creature. And the cloudy overcast day made the forest seem even darker than it would normally be this time of day. Back at Jacob's, Gene informed them that there was nothing left that he could do but file it under an unknown animal sighting, which made both Kenny and Jacob anything but happy. Jacob and Kenny spent the next couple of days trying to warn their neighbors to use caution when they were out in the forest. Most of their friends just laughed at them and said they had most likely just seen a bear or something. No one believed them except William, who had also seen it himself the same day they had. He had even taken a shot at it, but missed. Jacob, William, and Kenny knew what they had seen, and they knew it was still out there, and they didn't care who believed them and who didn't. Over the next few weeks, more and more neighbors began to take the story a little more seriously, as family pets began to disappear, and other pets were found mangled. Other farms in the area began to find their cows and other livestock torn open, with their throats ripped out. Just a week after shooting the creature in his yard, Jacob's own German Shepherd was found dead with its throat torn out and it was hanging across a limb in a tree in his front yard. It almost seemed like a revenge killing. A few days later, one of William's new animals died the same way. Some people in the area still don't believe. They think the whole story was made up. But Jacob and Kenny know that there is still something out there in the forest. They still occasionally find tracks or a slaughtered cow or goat. They still hear the blood curling screams off into the woods at night. They know that there is still something out there watching and waiting, biding its time. Something cold and cunning and cruel. Something not human with a taste for blood and revenge.
Okay, so I've been a skeptic of creepy paranormal things my entire life. I have never believed in that type of stuff. But the things I have heard, witnessed, and my grandparents' farm shakes me to my core. My grandparents own a large plot of land in central Missouri, and they have owned that land for around 40 years. I've been to that farm over 10 times, and every time I go, I always get this terrifying feeling that something is watching me. Like, there's always something behind my back. I have also had many strange encounters there that are downright bizarre. My first encounter with whatever the hell this thing was, was when I was around the age of 7 or 9. I'm currently 14. We had brought our dog named Spot to that farm. He was a silver lab who I loved dearly. I was exploring the forest behind the house, just enjoying the summer breeze, when my dog started growling. A deep, sinister growl that I had never heard him make. I turned around quickly to see what he was growling at, but I couldn't see anything but forest among more forest. While my eyes were scanning the area of where my dog was growling, some animal shot out of the brush so fast I could barely see what it was and before I knew it, it was gone. I sat there for what felt like an eternity absolutely flabbergasted by what I just witnessed. From what I could see of it, it looked like a coyote, but the speed at which it moved was absolutely insane. It moved like at 90 miles an hour and made almost no noise. But the most creepy part was that the place it jumped out of didn't even make an imprint of where it was laying. And from where I viewed it jumping up, I should have been able to easily see where it was hiding. Shocked by what I witnessed, I just decided that was enough and went back inside the house. My second encounter happened when I was around 10. I was visiting the place. And like usual, I was getting the feeling I was being watched. That first day was normal and nothing really creepy happened. I was just spending quality time with family. But when night came, that's when shit started happening. I was trying to sleep in the twin bed that was shared by my mom's brother when he used to live there. That's when I heard tapping. Not tiny little taps, but loud tap. Almost like it was banging. It was coming from the direction of the window. I slowly sat up and looked at the window, but there was nothing. So I assumed it was just some animal or something like that. Five minutes passed and no tapping and I was drifting off to sleep when, this time, not a tap, a slam, a loud slam directly into the window. I'm not talking about like a hit. It sounded as if something absolutely massive hit the window. I shot up so quickly I nearly passed out. I decided enough was enough and grabbed the flashlight in the drawer and shined it out the window. Nothing. 10 seconds passed. Nothing. I was about to go crawl into my mom's bed when I heard it. A screech. A screech that was not achievable by any human. So loud it pierced the quiet peaceful summer night. I can't put into words what that sound sounded like, but it was dark and horrible, and I still remember it to this day. I froze, unable to move muscle. I was so scared. I was sitting there still as a statue, petrified by what I heard. That's when my instincts kicked in and they told me to run into my mom's room. 
which I did. For some reason, I didn't wake her up. I just cuddled up next to her and didn't sleep the entire night. All I could think of was that sound, that horrific, terrible, bloody screech. My next encounter was when I was around the age of 13. I was back at my grandparents, just enjoying my time, like I always do when my grandpa suggested that we go deer watching. I agreed because I had been doing this since as long as I could remember. And it was never an issue and it was extremely fun. So we took the Polaris and we went around 6 to 7 p.m. to look for deer. We decided to go into the most eastern pasture because that's usually where we spotted the most deer. 30 minutes passed and we had seen a few deer but not as much as we usually do. But then, this is where the ship begins. I get that feeling again. That dreadful feeling that something is there and the shadows watching me. But this time, it's a lot more intense. Like if it's right up behind me, but when I look, it's never there. But this time, it appears that my grandpa feels the same presence as me too. And just to let you all know, my grandpa is a very laid back individual, always joking and having a laugh. The only time I've seen him be very serious is when my great uncle died a couple of years ago. So when I started feeling that I'm being watched, my grandpa goes from a happy and laid back expression to very serious and alert. He gripped the wheel so tight, his knuckles turned white, and he was just looking around like to make sure something wasn't following us. He then made a massive U-turn out of nowhere and started heading back to the house. I asked him, what are you doing? And he replied with, we're heading back to the house. The tone of his voice was cold, like he had witnessed someone being murdered. At this point, he was gripping the wheel even harder and was absolutely going pedal to the metal full speed back to the house. I decided not to ask any questions until we got back to the house, which we did in no time at all. Once we were there, he rushed me into the house, checking his back to make sure something wasn't there. When we were inside, he closed and locked the door tight. His behavior was very alarming and it really shocked me to my core. I then decided that all of the stuff I had witnessed was enough and I only asked them one question. What the hell is going on here? When I said that, he looked at me and gave me a cold expression and said, I have some things I need to explain to you. We then sat down for 30 minutes and he explained that whatever this thing was, it was living on this property and it has been here since the day he moved in and he and my mother experienced the same thing that was happening to me the very first few years of living here. He explained that he has seen whatever this thing is and it doesn't like new visitors. He told me about all the things he had witnessed and experienced and it seemed to have been very pretty similar to what was happening to me. He told me that he knew this was going to happen to me and that he was always watching to make sure I never got hurt because he knew this creature better than anyone else. We talked some more but all of it was the same. It was now late and he decided that I couldn't sleep alone. So he had me sleep with my mom. We promptly left the next morning. I have not been back since that day. This last encounter isn't really an encounter. Two things have happened at my grandparents farm. Recently we brought my sister's horse to the farm. The first night for the horse was hell. My sister's horse has always been very friendly and not shy. 
but the first night of my sister's horse being at the farm was bizarre. The next morning, my grandpa woke up and was doing his usual chores and went to go feed the horse. He noticed that the horse was acting very weird, extremely shy and timid, but when he took a better look, he was shocked. The horse had three 10-inch gashes down its side, like something had clawed at it. It was ruled out that the horse ran into the fence, but I think otherwise. Also, around the same time, my grandparents adopted a dog and named it Panda. Panda was a Jack Russell Terrier who was two months of age. Five days later, he was found dead with deep puncture wounds on his body and with his neck slashed up. They said it was a bobcat or mountain lion, but I also think otherwise. Super creeped out by my experience I had over the weekend and curious what others think. I was driving through a rural part of North California, 30 miles from the nearest town. As I was driving down the road, a deer ran out in front of my car. I had no reaction time and I hit it at 55 miles per hour. It ripped my bumper off and the bumper was dragging under my car. I pulled over and called my dad for help. I then get out to look for a deer in the road. I know it was dead because there was blood sprayed all over my vehicle and I hit it square on. I walked around 20 to 30 yards away and I got an overwhelming sense of being watched. I couldn't find the deer so I turned and speed walked back to my car. It was around 7 p.m. and it was extremely dark. No other vehicles were driving by, no street lights, and barely any cell service. My dad was over an hour away, so I called a friend who lived a little closer, and he started on his way to me. While I sat in the car playing on my phone, I began to hear whistling and murmurs outside my car. I got chills, and the hair on my arms and neck stood up. There was one house to my right, but I didn't see any vehicles in the driveway or people moving or people moving around inside. I was on the side of the road by myself for 45 minutes and would occasionally hear these noises. I'm not sure what or who it was, but if anyone has any ideas, I would love to hear. I'm freaked out and I'm now scared of being outside in the dark by myself. Thanks. My roommate has told me the story a few times and I want to see if anyone else has had similar experiences. As he tells it, he was driving home super late at night, maybe around 3 or 4 a.m. in a suburb of Phoenix, Arizona, both times that this occurred. The first time, he was driving alone on a road that has an open field to the left of it, when out of nowhere, a black figure on all fours bounds up out of the field comes up out of the field and across the road in front of his car. As soon as the figure got to the other side of the road, it stops with inhuman quickness, turns around and looks directly at my roommate. He described the figure as looking simian, completely black, except for the face. The creature's face was a stark white human face, not white as in Caucasian, but white as snow. This happened again a few weeks later, but this time the creature was sitting 
in a tree. As his car approached, it climbed down the tree again with quickness, bounded across the road, stopped on a dime, and turned around and made eye contact with him. This time, he had a friend in the vehicle who also saw it and began freaking out. It was the same exact thing as the first time. A simian black body with a snow white expressionless human face. My roommate, as always, the curious one, turned the vehicle around and began searching for the creature, but it was nowhere to be seen. While trading stories around a campfire, my friend recalled an encounter he had while serving an LDS mission. My friend's mission region had a reservation within its boundaries. However, it was far from where he was serving. On one occasion, him and his mission companion were told to travel more far than usual to meet with some investigators. This, however, took them near the reservation. On their way home, their car ran out of gas, and it wasn't until late at night that they were able to continue the journey home. My friend, who was driving while his companion slept in the passenger seat, chose a different route that took him through some back roads in an attempt to try to get home sooner. He told us he was driving above the speed limit when he noticed movement in the woods lining the road. Because coyotes were common in the area, he took little notice first. Then he looked out the window and slammed on the brakes. The sudden stop made his companion awake, who wanted to know what was wrong. My friend was shaken and said he would tell him once they got home. He only told him to say a prayer. By the time they made it home, his companion was dying to know what happened. And my friend told him, as I was driving, I looked down at the road next to the vehicle and I saw six men running on all fours, keeping up with the car. I was driving 40 miles per hour. This is my father's story, written from his perspective. When I was about 11 or 12, we lived in a small house made of mud and stone. A lot like our house now, it was two of my brothers and I in the house. Everyone else had gone to the Hymas festival and left us to tend the sheep. We were getting ready for bed when we heard the dogs going crazy outside, thinking it was nothing more than coyotes howling in the distance. We screamed at them to be quiet. We began to fall asleep and the dogs would not be quiet. Somehow, I was able to go to sleep for a few hours. Then, I woke up very late in the night. It was very quiet and still in the house, except for my brother snoring. I then realized I needed to use the bathroom, so I woke up my brother to take me to the outhouse in the back. He teased me about being scared, which I was. We went out with our flashlight to the outhouse. The dogs then began with their crazy barking out in the brush, going from one place to the next. My brother went first and I waited outside for him. While I was waiting, I tried to follow the dogs with my flashlight. Then there was a very loud whine from one of the dogs. Everything went quiet again. It was way too quiet for that time of the year. Not even the sheep were making noise. Suddenly, I heard a few of the dogs by the truck. When I looked over, there was this man 
He was unbelievably tall, leaning one arm on the cab roof of the truck. He was looking at the dogs for a little bit, and then suddenly kicking one of them, making them scatter in different directions. The thing then looked up at me, and I saw its face. It had a pure white face, like a full moon, two burning red eyes, and a slight smile that was pure black. I could not move or make a sound. It began to walk towards me with long strides until it finally towered over me. All I began to see was dark red, like the color of the blood when you cut the throat of a sheep. I kept getting deeper and deeper into its eyes. I could faintly hear my brother coming out of the outhouse. With this, the thing looked up at him. Reality came rushing back to me. I noticed that my brother was too distracted with his buckle to realize what was going on. I also noticed that this thing had long hands hovering just inches from my head. Its skin was black ash and he smelled like a bloated dead animal in summer. I was still unable to move or speak. The skinwalker began to move towards my brother. Finally, noticing this figure, my brother became paralyzed as I was. Closer and closer it drew, reaching an arm out towards my brother's head. When something finally snapped in me, I became unbearably angry. I broke from this trance and lunged at the skinwalker, raising my arms like a wild animal and baring my teeth at it. A growl came out that I never knew I could make. I became more and more angry at the thing that was trying to hurt us. It kept that smile at first, but the angrier I got, the more the smile faded. Finally, with everything I had, I began to make this primal roar at it. It fell backwards and ran away into the night. Looking back at me, its eyes were dim and dull. Its smile now long gone. The next morning, the family returned home from the festival. After telling the story to my parents, they quickly hired a medicine man. My father told me a story once. I'll never forget it, for a few reasons that is. I think it's the first story he ever told me as a child. It's also the story of how my grandfather died. But to be honest, that isn't the reason. You hear stories on TV, or sometimes you overhear something in a public place. People talk about a ghost. Aliens, and you think to yourself, this isn't real, they're making it up, or they're mistaken, or they're crazy, or something along those lines. You just can't believe it until something happens, something that brings it all together, connects the dots in a way you didn't think of before. Maybe it happens to you, maybe you hear the same story again and again, happening to different people. It doesn't take long for the world to become a lot bigger than you thought it was. As I said, this is a story my father told me, but I never believed it. Even though he swore up and down it was real, it wasn't until I started clicking around the internet that I started to believe. I started to hear other stories just like the one my father told me. It didn't take me long to believe in the rake. That's not what my father called it, of course. He's never used the internet in his life. He wouldn't know what the consensus has taken to naming it. When he chose to call it something other than it or that thing, he called it Skinwalker. After an old Navajo hotel, his grandfather told him, but... I'm going to tell you the story exactly the same way he told it to me. We were out hunting one night. 
he would tell me. Coyotes. We would kill them for 50 bucks a skin. They lived on a dairy farm in Ohio. We would do it every night because we needed the money. Sometimes, while we were out, we would come on a deer and kill it. The landlord didn't mind it, and it could feed our family for a few nights and save us some money. Anyway, we were done making our rounds and heading home, walking, because we didn't have a car or some four-wheeler back then. We would cut through the woods. That's when we came up on it. Blood. Everywhere. Splatter on the trees. In the grass. In the creek. Everywhere. At first we figured it was a pack of coyotes. We had seen it sometimes. They can scavenge and start hunting deer or cattle. The worst was when they bred with feral dogs. But this was nothing like that. See, when a pack of dogs or wolves or coyotes attack something, they'll do it the right way. They'll pick one that's weak or sick or old or just small. They'll hunt it, draw it into a corner, some place it can get out of, and they'll run it right to the biggest one, the alpha. And that deer will never see that alpha. It might hear it, but it won't see it. It'll just notice that its own throat is gone, and then it'll drop dead. It's quick, and it's clean. But that wasn't what happened here. Something had run up on a den of deer. Coyotes won't attack a den, nor would a pack of wolves, because they'll get too much of a fight. There were three, I think three bodies, just torn apart. A leg here, a torso there. A predator doesn't do that. They don't leave behind scraps. Whatever had done this, hadn't done it for food. It had done it for fun. But we didn't know that. We saw a bunch of corpses, torn bodies, and we think it's something we gotta take care of. I remember my dad telling me to go home. He thought it was a pack of feral dogs, but I wasn't gonna leave him. And I damn sure wasn't walking through two miles of woods alone with nothing but a 22 and a pocket knife. He was only 13 at the time. So a 22 rifle was about the only gun he could use. Dad had the shotgun, and I wasn't going anywhere without it. It took me a while to convince him, but finally we began tracking whatever did that. It wasn't difficult, either. We just followed the blood. It seemed like that thing bled a deer before it got away, or it dragged one for a mile. I don't know. I know that I never seen my dad scared before that night. We started hearing noises, and I've been in a lot of woods my whole life. I've been all over the world, and I ain't never heard noises like I heard that night. I heard things screaming. Deer, fox, rabbits, raccoons, birds, just scared. Keep in mind, this is maybe 12 or 1 o'clock, except the fox and some birds. Nothing was supposed to even be awake. But they weren't just awake, they were moving. I saw a flock of birds that night fly straight into trees just trying to get out of there. We came up on a pack of coyotes, nearly shot a couple thinking it was what we were looking for. But then we saw they were running towards us, and they ran right past us, they didn't even notice. Then some of the deer did the same, then some rabbits, squirrels, foxes. Even a couple of wild hogs. These things were supposed to be eating each other. And the only thing they cared about was getting out of there. We should have put it together. That maybe whatever we were tracking. It wasn't something we were supposed to see. And maybe it wasn't something we could kill. I don't even know why we didn't just go home. I guess we were curious. I think that was my dad's nature. To go towards trouble to fight and knowing what I knew about what my father did during the war my nature was to stay close to him we finally get into an open valley it was normally a soy field but it wasn't in season so it was just flat dirt we saw the tracks then a lot of the animals fleeing the forest had paved over the land but where that deer blood was 
Nothing had taken a single step. It's almost like they were leaving it for us to find. The tracks were shallow. Whatever it was couldn't have weighed more than 100 pounds. But that didn't mean much. A bobcat weighing 40 pounds wet nearly tore out my damn throat once. All that means is that it's quick and hard to hit. So we follow the tracks and it doesn't take us long to find out where it is. There's this old schoolhouse that sits on top of a hill. Half of it had been ripped out by a tornado. But nobody lived there. Not for a long time. We caught homeless people in there. Sometimes. Or druggies looking for a safe place to shoot up. We figured maybe that was it. Maybe it was some sick kid riding a high. But we didn't think that for long. We get within 50 yards and we hear this noise. A screeching kind of sound. It was sort of made up of two different sounds. One was a high pitched screech. Another was a low pitched growl. It was making both at the same time. We get within 20 yards and we hear the sound. I can remember thinking that it sounded like paper being torn apart while someone was swinging water in a bucket back and forth. Dad looks at me, kneels down, and whispers, I gotta stay behind him, cause we're about to corner him. Any animal will fight when it's cornered, especially when it's a predator. But we can tell by the tracks that it's just one. He tells me it's most likely a single, feral dog, most likely rabbit. The plan is to sneak up on it while it's eating, shoot it, and then keep shooting it till it don't move anymore. Then, we slit its throat. If it gets too dead, it's my job to shoot it or stab it to get it off of him. So he walks up, and I'm right behind him. Just a tad to his side so I can see what it is. I wish to this day, I hadn't. It was leaning over a carcass, tears off its flesh, and throws what it doesn't nibble aside. There's blood all over the brick, glistening in the moonlight. It's pale white, human looking, but not quite human. It had arms and legs like a human, but it sat like a monkey. It was hunched over. Its hands weren't normal. It had long fingers with claws at the end. So we see that and my dad hesitates. He wasn't about to fire on a person. So he clears his throat to try to get it to turn around. I swear to God, all the noise just ceased. I ain't never heard true silence before that. Nothing, and I mean nothing, made any noise. Which made it all the louder when it turned around. Made this shrill cry and jumped on dad. He got a shot off. I think he missed. If he hit the thing, it didn't mind. But it was on him. I start shooting it with a 22 point blank. But it barely bled the thing. I got off five rounds. And then I started hitting it with the gun butt. But it wasn't budging. It didn't even acknowledge that I was there. It clawed at my dad, taking off bits of his flesh. It started on his torso, ripping off the skin. Then it moved up. It tore off his throat. It tore off his nose, his eyes. It scalped him. Then it started digging in and ripped off the bottom half of his jaw. The little bones in that tube in your neck. Then his ribs. I don't exactly remember what happened, but somehow... My dad's knife ends up in this thing's shoulder, and my dad ends up on my back. I'm running, and by God, I'm running faster than I ever run before or after, and it's following me. I end up back in the woods, opposite the ones we've been in. I'm heading towards the landlord's house, because it's half a mile away. I can hear this thing screeching and moaning. I hear the tree branches crack and get thrown around. It sounds like someone's taking an axe to every single tree I pass. It's cracking so loud and often, but I just ain't looking back. Finally, I trip into gravel. I look up, and there's my landlord and bunch of his buddies drinking around a campfire. I scream and I cry, and they come over. I'm telling them to call an ambulance, and he looks at me, 
and I'll never forget what he said. What is that on your back? He asked me. Just as he said it, he saw. One of those god-awful flannel shirts my dad wore everywhere. It was what was left of my dad. Most of his head, his torso, but nothing after the waist. Suddenly, we hear it, screeching. He grabs me. My dad gets thrown on the ground. I'm fighting him, crying, because I think we can still save him, somehow. But my dad had been gone before I ever picked him up. He has to pick me up and throw me inside before I come with him. He and his buddies were all inside and they're locking doors and getting guns. The landlord's asking me, what happened, what happened? But I just don't know what to tell him. He pieced enough of it all together to understand that there was something dangerous out there. All the lights in the house are on and someone calls the cops. They'll be there, but in 15 minutes. We look outside and see a walk in front of the fire they made. Don't know what it is. One of them says it looks like an ape. Suddenly, something goes through the window. We shoot at it, but it ain't the thing. It's a dog. My landlord's dog. Just the body though, not his head or legs. We start pushing things in front of doors and windows when we hear something in the garage. I remember one of his friends saying that the doors were open. We hear metal and glass just get ripped apart. We put a couch and a TV in front of the door to the garage. It banged around some more, but then it got quiet. Not silent, like it was before. We could hear it move around some, and the guys were talking, making sure the guns were ready. Someone hands me a pistol. No sooner did I cock the hammer back did we hear something shatter upstairs. Then we heard it screech again, except now it was louder, and it didn't echo and fade out, because now it was inside the house. We all rushed to the one door leading upstairs, and we got to it just as that thing did. It opened it just a bit, and four or five men just slammed into it. It got its hand through. Someone with a shotgun took care of that, put the barrel right up to its wrist and pulled the trigger, cut its hand off, clean. That only pissed it off though, it started pushing on the door, clawing. We were on one side pushing as best as we could, and it was on the other side doing the same. That wood wasn't just going to hold it, so someone tells us to keep our heads down. Suddenly, the top half of the door is just gone. My ears are ringing, and there are splinters everywhere. Two or three of them just unloaded on the top of that door. I don't really know where it went after that. The police got there. I was still glued to that door what was left of it. The sun was up before they got me off of it. They put me in a hospital for a while. A lot of people talked to me, but I didn't talk back. Not for a long, long time. When I got back home, I got a job from the landlord, working on the farm. We didn't talk much, not about that thing, but I signed up for the army when I was 19, and he sat me down to drink some scotch as a send-off. I then asked, right away, what the police told him. The story that they told was that it was a wild animal, most likely a wolf, or maybe a bear that had migrated north. I then asked them how they could say that when they had the hand. He looks at me, stunned. He tells me that the hand never made it back to the station. The cop who had it in his car wrecked, drove into a tree, and died on impact. The hand was never found, most likely taken away by an animal. The cops, when they would acknowledge the hand that existed at all, said it was simply the paw of a bear that looked like a human hand. I never talked to the landlord again. He went missing when I was in basic. The cops never found him. They said he owed some people some money and just ran away. But I don't think it's that simple. I never went back to those woods. I wouldn't even if I had the whole goddamn US Army at my back. But that was a lie. When my mother died, I don't think my father felt he had anything left and that he might as well settle old scores. 
he went to those woods and he never came back. The FBI was called. They did a show for everyone involved, but I knew they weren't actually looking. I had to get one of the agents drunk and slip him a few fifties before he finally told me that they get a few calls about those woods every year, about someone up and vanishing, but that was all he wanted to tell me. Before he got up and left with the rest of his team, he got a napkin and he wrote the rake. I didn't know what he was talking about until I looked it up on the internet. But to be honest, I wish I would have rather not known. Before I begin, I would like to say that this is a very long story. It's been something that's haunted me since I was six years old. Since my first encounter with it, I had dreams about this and two very specific encounters with the creature. I'm sharing this story so I could possibly find help on what to do or how to get rid of this creature that's been hunting me since I can remember. Just for background, I'm a 21 year old female and still worry about this creature finding me, but I'll get into detail why later. For now, here's my story. I would always go camping with my grandparents, who I call my gammy and gampy at the end of my school years. I would always look forward to it since I grew up loving the outdoors and the woods. I especially loved camping, loving the idea of having s'mores, taking long hikes, being around the campfire, and of course, the wildlife that we would see. Now, I grew up in California, mostly near cities, so the forest was like my true home to me. I always prefer being near trees and dirt instead of buildings and crowded places. Besides, the woods were more quiet and more peaceful. I always felt safe when I was there, like nothing could ever hurt me. But something strange would always happen at the end of the month of May. I would have this reoccurring dream during the last week of my school year. I would be in the woods, walking alone down a dirt trail. The woods were always quiet. I would continue to walk this path until I saw this red fox poke its head from behind a tree. Its eyes were always strangely human-like, but they were yellow and somehow looked like teddy bear eyes, and it would always just stare at me. It wouldn't make a sound at all. It would just watch me. Usually, in my dream, I would go up and pet it, making the fox finally make a noise, mostly a soft growl. Then I would continue walking, and it would follow me. The first time I would have this dream was when I was actually around five years old, and it lasted until I was about 11. As the years went by, it would be the same exact thing. I would walk in the woods, find this fox, pet it, then continue on with my hike with it alongside me. But when I was having the same dream on the fourth time, it would start to walk behind me. That's when I started to feel uneasy about this fox. I could hear it making odd noises, but every time I went back to look, it was just walking like nothing was wrong, even somehow giving me a smile. Sorry to go on about a dream, but I now believe that this was a warning of the creature. Now that the dream is out the way, I can talk about my first true encounter. I was six years old and I was going on a camping trip with my gammy and gampy for about a week. Of course, I was very excited. I was barely able to keep myself in school for the last day of kindergarten. They had picked me up right as the bell had rung and already had the camping trailer attached to my gampy's truck. I remember he drove an old red truck that only had three seats, with me being always in the middle. It took about two hours to get there, and another good hour to find our usual camping spot. 
It was deep into the woods and far from other people, as my gammy wasn't too fond of being around other people while we were camping. As they were setting up the camping trailer, I wandered around the campsite, loving to dig in the dirt for bugs. I had sat down on the dirt and started to dig, but I noticed how quiet the woods were. It was never quiet, not even in the dead of night. I thought it was odd, but being only six, I didn't think too hard about it. As I continued to dig for bugs, however, I thought I heard my gammy call for me. She would always call me Sugar Booger. That being a nickname she gave me since I was born. That's what I had heard. But it sounded like she was very far away and somewhat sick. Sugar Booger. I looked up where I heard it coming from, which was from the woods. But there was no way she was there because she was still unloading stuff from the truck. Even at the age of six, it didn't feel right. So I walked closer to my grandparents and stayed next to them. I soon forgot about this weird encounter I had as we began to have fun. For the rest of the day, we played card games, sat next to the campfire as we ate dinner and stared up into the stars. I always loved seeing the stars. There was never any where I lived at. We started to get sleepy around 9 p.m., I believe, and we started to get ready for bed. There were bunk beds that me and my gammy would sleep on, keeping our luggage on the top bunk, and we would sleep on the bottom bunk. Due to my gampy snoring, he would sleep on the couch of the trailer. I would always sleep next to the trailer window, just in case I couldn't sleep and wanted to look outside. I fell asleep pretty quickly though, that being the last day of school and all, it was pretty exhausting. I remember waking up maybe hours later. It was still pitch black outside. It wasn't weird for me to wake up late in the night since I always had sleeping issues. I rolled onto my side trying to fall back asleep until I heard sugar sugar. my eyes immediately shot open as I heard my nickname being spoken but I knew it wasn't either of my grandparents. They were both asleep and they were never known to sleep talk before. I started to feel this horrible feeling in my gut like whatever I was hearing wanted to really hurt me. Even at the age of six I knew this wasn't normal. Then I started to hear tapping at the trailer window. It was soft but loud enough for me to hear it. I just sat there frozen in fear. I was trying to just brush it off as tree branches or rain but I just knew it wasn't it. I could tell it was really someone or something tapping on the window. Then I decided to be brave and look. Big mistake. I pulled the curtain away to only peek and all I saw were these large yellow eyes. They seemed glassy yet not real. They looked like giant teddy bear eyes but cold and unwelcoming. I remember in that moment I panicked and quickly closed the curtain back up. I then hid under the blanket that being the only thing I knew to do when I saw a monster. I could feel tears falling down my face. I never had been so terrified in my life. I just curled up into my gammy side and clung to her all night long. That damn tapping only getting louder and more persistent throughout the night. I don't remember falling asleep, but somehow I did. I do remember my gampy waking me up around noon, saying how if I got up quick enough, we could still go fishing, but I didn't want to leave the trailer at all. Terrified that whatever I saw the night before would still be out there. I did eventually go outside, but I was just looking around, horrified that whatever saw me last night would get me. My gammy immediately knew I was scared and pulled me into a hug when she saw me, asking me what was wrong. I did tell her what I saw and heard 
And to my surprise, she believed me. The next thing I know, she was telling my gampy that we were moving campsites. It took a bit to convince him, but he did eventually start to pack up and hook the trailer onto his truck. I was put into the truck so I could fall asleep, but I just couldn't. I kept feeling that I was being watched, thinking that every little noise was that thing I saw. That if I closed my eyes even for a second, it would get me. My gammy wasn't too far from me when I heard it again. But this time, it was my actual name. Aaliyah. In that moment, I had never seen my gammy move so fast. She looked up into the bushes where we heard it, then to me. She then got in the truck with me and pulled me into a tight, protective hug. I began to cry all over again, telling her how I wanted to just go back home. That's when my gampy got into the truck as well. And since I was crying so hard to the point I was coughing, he agreed we could go home. We started to head out the campsite, still hurt that this trip had been ruined by something. But I still didn't know what. That's when something in my head told me to look back. I slowly did, feeling an ice cold fear wash over me as I saw something. A red fox sitting in the middle of the campsite, sitting there with large yellow eyes. The same red fox from my dream, somehow curling its lips into an eerie smile. After that encounter, we never did go back to that campsite. We did continue to camp, but in more populated areas. I never told my grandma what I saw, but she had told me to trust my gut. She knew that I was sensitive to certain entities, and that would help me if I trusted it. Now, this would be the end of the story, but I'm afraid it isn't. There was one more encounter I had with the creature, and it was much more terrifying than the first time. The second encounter I had was when I was 17, many years later. By this time, I knew very well what a skinwalker was now, and I was still very paranoid every time I went near wooded areas. I still worried about seeing that fox, but I never really thought about it too much. Me and my two younger siblings were staying at a relative's house for Christmas, them living way up into a mountain area. I think they were my great aunt and uncle, but I'm not sure. Where they lived, there was no service at all. So unless we hooked up into their Wi-Fi, we had no phone. I didn't mind the house. I was still loving the woods, no matter what happened. Even though at night, I hated how they didn't close the window curtains, making it easy for anything outside to see inside. But I did feel safe while inside the house, knowing that they wouldn't let anything hurt us. Lucky for all of us, it didn't snow where they lived, so we could go outside and run around. They also had this beautiful black lab. She was about a year old. Her name was Pam. She was very playful and normally wouldn't listen to anyone but my uncle. One of the days we were there, my little sister and our aunt went out to the store for a nice girl's day. Even though I'm a girl, I wanted to go hiking with my uncle and my little brother. We left pretty early since the hike we were doing was four hours of walking into town. It was a really chilly morning, but since we were doing so much walking, it felt great. We also decided to take Pam. It was a good way for her to get some exercise and have fun. About maybe an hour into our walk, I started to slow down a bit, wanting to enjoy the beautiful forest. It was so peaceful, I could have stayed there, but as we continued to walk, I started to feel something odd. I noticed how quiet the forest had become. Hearing only footsteps and my brother talking to our uncle, Pam noticed it too. Her ears going straight up and growling softly. I started to pick up my pace to get next to my brother. I was worried that possibly a coyote or mountain lion was nearby, but I knew that they wouldn't be out at this time though. Even if they were, they didn't walk near the roads. 
My little brother was only nine at that time, and being the oldest sibling, my natural instincts to protect him kicked in. My uncle noticed the silence as well, telling us to stay close to him and Pam, who was now next to me and still growling. I began to feel that horrible feeling again, that ice cold fear I once felt when I was six. I tried so hard to not think of the creature, but it was all I could worry about. I was scared. I felt like I was back to being that scared little six year old girl again. I had to stop for a moment though, seeing my shoelace came undone. I quickly kneeled down to tie it back up, trying to hurry and just get out of there. And that's when I heard it. Aaliyah. In that moment, my heart dropped into my stomach. My eyes were widened and I could just feel myself start to shake from fear. It was right next to me. I heard it clear as day. I slowly turned my head and there it was. That same red fox still having those horrid yellow eyes and that same demented smile. Only this time I saw it much more clearly. Its fur looked so matted and disgusting. The smell it had was like rotten, decaying flesh mixed with garbage. Its limbs were much too long for a normal fox. The back legs bending completely the wrong way. Those eyes were still the worst thing about it. But now they looked emptier than I had remembered. I wanted to scream, to run, to cry, but I just couldn't. I was frozen as I was, too scared to even blink. Then I heard it speak again. This time, however, it had mimicked my little brother's voice. Found you. Before anything else could happen, Pam suddenly jumped in front of me and started to bark like mad, snapping and growling so aggressively that it scared me out of my frozen trance. When I looked back, it was gone. I used that moment to run over to my brother and uncle, who didn't see what I saw as they were too far ahead now. But I heard my uncle start to pray and sing a song under his breath, keeping my brother and myself close to him. I was just too scared to even look back, so I just kept my eyes on the ground and refused to stop walking. Pam had stopped barking, but she was still growling and never left my side as we continued our hike. My little brother was a bit worried, but he just thought it was a coyote. When we finally made it into town, my uncle had called our aunt and told her to pick us up, saying something about how it wasn't safe for us to walk back. Thankfully, she did come and get us, but she was confused since we talked about that hike for days. On the car ride back, Pam never left me alone. She was right with me the entire time. She knew that thing was after me and she was protecting me. I was very grateful that she was with us. Who knows what would have happened if she wasn't. When we got back to the house, I was talked to by my uncle and aunt. I told them what happened and what I saw. And then they started to pray and check that all the locks were shut tight. My aunt started putting something around the doors. I now believe it was most likely ashes, but I never did find out. Unfortunately, this made our Christmas vacation cut short as they were worried that I was not safe while still in the woods. We had to be taken home the next day. They made an excuse of how there was an emergency with a friend and that they had to help them out. I felt horrible that this Christmas was ruined, but once I did leave the woods, I truly felt safe again. Before they had to drive back home though, they told me that it wasn't my fault and that lucky for all of us, it didn't hurt me or the other kids. It did make me feel a bit better, but it still brought up a lot of questions and worries. It was still around. How? Why? What did it want from me? Does it want my skin? My soul? Was I just going to be tormented? by this thing forever? I still don't have answers to these questions and that's what really scares me. Now I have long moved from California and now live in Kentucky. 
I do live in the woods, but so far, that thing hasn't found me. I know that seems very stupid on my part, but life had changed a lot when I was growing up. I was given no other option to live somewhere else, and my grandpa in Kentucky was kind enough to let me live with him. So please don't call me an idiot for moving to the woods when I had no other choice. Anyways, I am happy it hasn't found me, but I'm still worried. Can it still find me? Is it still hunting me? I'm not close to anyone who knows truly on how to get rid of this thing. And that's why I'm telling my story now so I can possibly find help. So please, if there's anyone out there who does know, please help me. Alex, Jim, and I decided to go camping. We set up camp, decided to just drink and talk, and that's what we did all night. About anything and everything that came to mind. It was 3 a.m. and we were still chatting away until we heard something in the trees. Some kind of cracking sound. Could be a bird, said Jim. A big damn bird, I replied with slight confusion. Could be a monkey, joked Alex. We shared a laugh and ignored the sound and continued to talk. Another half hour had passed and the sound had completely stopped. I wonder what that was anyway, Alex said. Well, I have no clue, I replied, taking a sip of my beer. Well... I hope it's gone, because I need a piss, Jim said, standing up and heading to the trees. A few minutes passed, and Alex and I grew concerned. We best go look for him, said Alex. He sounded a little annoyed. We stood up and walked in the direction Jim went. It didn't take long to find the first drop of blood and then the trail that led deeper into the woods. What the fuck? I said, shaking. We began shouting for him, following the trail. I was the first to see him, standing in a clearing about 10 meters away. He was facing away from us. We tried shouting, but we got no response. We walked closer and we noticed him twitching violently. He was covered in blood and clearly beat up. I was about to say his name once again, but the word got stuck in my throat when I saw the bloody pile of meat on the floor next to him. I think Alex saw it too as he also went silent. As if by magic, Jim turned to us and we saw his face was literally hanging off and underneath was pale gray skin. We could also see a burning orange eye and part of a wide mouth with long sharp teeth where the skin was peeled off. Besides from this, Jim looked normal aside from a few cuts and bruises. As we stared into the single orange eye, the thing wearing Jim's skin pushed the peeling flesh back on. And there, Jim stood totally normal. Hey guys, let's go for a walk, he said in his normal voice. This thing also seemed to demonstrate excitement. Alex and I turned. We ran past our campsite and got straight in the car parked about a mile from our tent. I'm not sure if this Jim followed us. I swear I could hear thumping footsteps behind Alex and I. We reached the car and jumped in, pouring sweat and heaving. I started the car faster than ever before and drove at nearly 100 miles per hour all the way back home. When we arrived and got out, 
I walked around the back of the car only to see scratch marks on the bumper. I shivered as I realized how close he must have been. This was over 40 years ago. Alex never quite recovered and last I heard he was living in a mental hospital. I was thinking I may have to join him as I'm pretty sure I saw Jim a few weeks ago at a bar. I thought I was mad until I did some research. I would have done it sooner but I'm an old man now and we didn't have Google back in the day. I'm pretty sure we encountered a skinwalker and it may have found me after 40 years and I think it wants to finish the job and now it's pretty strange that I keep getting letters asking to catch up from my old friend Jim. My friend and I were at a party on the Hopi reservation in Polaka. It was getting late and we had a pretty good buzz on. Most of the people we knew had already trickled out, so we decided it was a good time as any to leave. We looked around for the friend who was supposed to give us a ride because we had all come together. We found him in a back bedroom, drunk and passed out. So we had no choice, we're gonna have to walk. The two of us lived on the other side of the gulch, a good two miles. Between were nothing but trees, scrubs, brushes, and some hills. We had barely cleared the houses onto the road passing between the wooded area when we got this funny feeling we were being watched. We decided to leave the road and cut through the trees. It wasn't the easiest walk, but it would cut the distance down some. And even though it was pitch black outside, we knew the way pretty well. We had been a good 20 minutes off the road and heading up towards the hills when that same feeling of being watched came upon us again. We both turned around at the same time, but it was so dark we couldn't see anything. But then, my friend Paul swore he heard some kind of cackling or mumbling. I didn't hear anything except for maybe the wind and the top of the trees at our back. By that time, none of us was going to admit it. We were feeling a little scared. Without saying a single word, we picked up the pace, moving along pretty good but not running. And that's when I heard it too. But now, it was more like heavy breathing. Paul then grabbed my arm and gave me a tug forward. We took off running straight up the hill, which wasn't that big, but it was still enough of a slope so I wasn't feeling it in my legs. And on top of that, I was drunk. Think about this for a second. Running up a hill, at night, drunk, complete darkness. And as you're running, you hear footsteps behind you and heavy breathing. Whatever it was though, stayed with us every step of the way. Right at the top, Paul and I stopped and turned around, expecting the thing to be right on us. But we were standing there, huffing and puffing, and looking at nothing but darkness. A few seconds passed, and then we heard a thin laughter, as if it was coming from down the hill and back from where we started running. We decided to keep moving and put some distance between us. We turned to go down the other side of the hill, and there, standing right in front of us, was this creature. It was standing up on two legs, like a circus dog, only much taller with both paws extended out in front of it. It had this coyote face and it was grinning at us, all of its teeth exposed and its tongue sliding from one side to the other. I couldn't believe how skinny it was, as if it hadn't ate in weeks. Its rounded stomach sticking out like one of those African kids in the charity ads and the skin sinking between its ribs. The smell was unbelievably bad, like the smell of an old, wet dog. 
We both jumped back with a scream, like two little schoolgirls. As we did, the creature dropped down on all fours and ran past us and down the hill back where we had come from. It was yipping and laughing all the way. Paul and I started praying like never before, swearing to Jesus that if he got us home safe, we would never drink again. The laughing, or whatever you want to call it, died down and disappeared. Wasting no time, the two of us made our way down that hill and into the trees that separated us from where we lived. As we walked along, we were trying to convince each other everything was okay. It was only a coyote out searching for a meal. We scared it, it jumped up at us, and then it ran away. We started feeling better about things overall. We got across the open field and into the trees. We made it all the way through there without anything else happening. However, just as we stepped out towards that first backyard that we needed to cut through to get to the street, we heard this unmistakable chatter, like some little monkey laughing coming out of the trees just behind us. It was followed by the sound of something moving through the branches and twigs. My friend Paul then yelled out some words that he said that his grandmother had taught him. And just like that, the noise ceased and it got real quiet. He then grabbed my arm again and we ran. We ran as fast as we could through that yard and out to the road. We ran straight for the house where Paul lives with his grandmother. When we got there, we found her awake and sitting in the kitchen with only a small candle for light. She was burning some cedar. When she saw us, she put her finger up to her lips and then pointed to the outside of the house. Her lips were moving but silently. We stood there still for a minute or two, and then she spoke out loud, saying it was okay. She then said a prayer, and that the skinwalker was now gone. I have no idea how she knew, and I didn't care. Needless to say, I spent the rest of the night there, sleeping where I knew I would be safe.